So I'm going to talk about the system and I'm going to talk about how we've arrived at it and a little bit of uh, information around coach behaviour, some of the data. And I've got Sean Rooney with me, who works at Leicester City, and he's going to talk about some of the application of the system at Leicester. Um, so why coach behaviour? Well, everybody cast their eye at the picture. We can see a very muscular young man with a very padded up kind of reacting to coach behaviour. Right? So there's something going on there. So we know that it impacts performance, but we've got something social and emotional going on, particularly with younger players. Uh, effect is just a fancy way of saying psychological outcomes. Yes, we get that bit, but we don't always think about that bit. And as you can see from the graphic, there's something going on there around the coach. Now, of all the things in the coaching process, you know, we can't control referees, the weather, the opposition, the mood of our play. We can't control any of those things. But in terms of coaching, the one thing that we can control is ourselves. We can think about what comes out of our mouths. We can think about how we set up practice. All of that stuff is under our control. So, you know, that's the one part of the process we actually have direct control over. What's good about coach behaviour, of course, is it's measurable and we can change it. So that leads us to research and interventions, which is kind of where I come in. OK, so I hope we're all in agreement that the relationship that we have with our athletes will, determine, will go some way to determining how effective our coaching is. There's no right way to coach, obviously, apart from the way that I'm going to tell you here today. Ah, it's a joke. See, so switched on. I'm only kidding. I don't mean that at all. Okay, there's no right way to coach. And deliberately put this into scale, okay? So substitute learners. I view athletes as learners. They, they learn. They perform. They do their thing. And down here, us coaches, when I say practice, how we organise training sessions, the types of things we do in training sessions, and how our behaviour accompanies that, will affect that learning. Now, it can affect that learning positively or negatively, and I work with some coaches who I would argue block athlete learning through their behaviour and practice. So they're not facilitating player learning. Ooh. So a little bit about the methodology. So the software and the methodology we, we use is based on systematic observation. This is the state-of-the-art 1950-something in education. People started using this. And it's come in and out of coaching, it's been in and out of fashion. Uh, it's been out a little bit f recently, but come back perhaps with the technology and the work that we're doing. So definition, trained observer, that's an important first thing. Set of guidelines and procedures, observe, record and analyse observable events and behaviours with the assumption that other observers using the same observation instrument, viewing the same sequence of events, would agree with the recorded data. I.e., if we have the tool and the instrument and we all go and watch one coach, we're all speaking the same language, we're all talking about the same things, and we're all describing coaching in the same way. Without the tool, all of us go and watch a coach work, we're talking about the things we like, we're seeing things in different ways, we're defining things in different ways. So this kind of pulls, the methodology kind of pulls us together and gives us a common space to look at coaching. What I find is that a lot of this goes on. So where technology is used, people will film, they'll make up their own checklists, their own sheets, they'll have their own definition, and we have run into all sorts of problems around objectivity, because we all have our personal biases, biases and preferences. It's not reliable, <laughs> and it's not valid. So the one thing that I would say about our instrument, it's gone through these scientific measures of reliability and validity, i.e. it does what it says on the tin. <sighs> skip over that. So, systematic observation. I can al already see you guys thinking, well, it's just behaviour. It doesn't explain the whole thing. It doesn't explain the context. It doesn't do all of this. It doesn't, you know, there's a lot missing if we just look at describable behaviour. You're right, but for me, it's, I call it the front porch, okay? We've got valid and reliable da baseline data. We've got the front porch to the house. So what we do reflects a whole range of other things. And we're then able to start talking about reflection, cognitive processes, all those sorts of things. So in my experience, and I've learnt it the hard way, when I work with coaches, the first conversation is, what do you do? What do you do? Let's talk about what you do with your athletes. And then we can reverse into other issues and questions rather than try and present some fancy scheme or model or theory. It's always about what they do. Usefully for us, we can use the data as feedback. We can reinforce areas of appropriate performance, however that's defined for those coaches. And we can make recommendations for practice. So there is a body of research around that. I, I, I'm part of that, but there's other people working from it. And I guess 
If you take nothing else from the presentation, it's the first point. Coaches are notoriously poor at <coughs> describing their own behaviour. So if we take ten coaches, only two of them will accurately describe their own behaviour. Eight of them will get it wrong. Yeah, I'll say that again. Only 20% of coaches can accurately describe their own behaviour. And I'm finding that again and again and again, regardless of level, experience, background. Coaches are generally unaware of what they do. What is, in, is interesting, if we ask their athletes, the stat flips around. So we take 10 athletes, eight of them will get it right. So if I want to know about you as a coach, I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to ask your athletes because they'll have a better idea and they'll be able to describe your behaviour to me better than you will be able to. Okay, so this low self-awareness. Okay, so I use a lot of questioning, work with a coach, um, spent a week with a coach, talking to him about his coaching. Yeah, I, I tend to be, I used to be really directive. Now I ask a lot of questioning. I think his questioning behaviour was something like 3% over the course of a week. So 97% of his behaviour wasn't questioning. But in his mind, I use a lot of questioning. Okay. Uh, the issue of question is interesting. I maybe come back to that or not. You know, I don't ask questions, they never know the <coughs> Jeffing answer. Okay, well maybe. Um, but what the research says is we have our practice environment, so the drills and skills that people do. We have the coach behaviour and we have the athlete learning and our understanding of how those things are connected isn't as strong as it could be. And I would go as far as to say coaches perhaps have a limited understanding of how those things fit together. Okay, so back in the 1870s when I first started doing this, systematic observation was a, pe a piece of paper and a pencil and you literally ticked behaviours as they came along, okay? And yeah, that's really exciting. But what, you know, I'm walking around, I'm talking, my hands are moving, all stuff's going on, so I'm chucking out a lot of behaviours and a lot of things are going on at the same time. But with a pen and paper, everything is sequential, so you can only have one behaviour following another. The technology breathes new life into this, so we can start getting layers of behaviour, so we can capture a coaching moment and layer in the different behaviours and get a really nice picture of what people are doing. So the instrument, we'll talk about that at the moment, has been through a published validation process. To my knowledge, it's the only system that's been validated in that way. So there's lots of observation instruments out there, but I don't think, I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's another one that's got that validity and reliability behind it, but I won't bore you with the details on that. The instrument itself, 23 primary behaviours, so feedback, instruction, the sort of thing that you'd expect to see, and the layering comes in. So we can look at feedback when it happens. We can look at feedback when it happens and to who. We can look at feedback when it happens to who and what's the content. So we can start layering in these different levels. We also talk a little bit about different types of question. Silence is a discrete behaviour. And importantly, practice type. Remember the stopwatch. Remember the stopwatch. So, we've got nine behaviour types plus transitions. Transitions is interesting. This guy was part of our process, and I did it as well. Typically, the university, you book a 90-minute session on the, on the 3G or whatever, 90 minutes. And what was really interesting, across three sports, football, hockey and rugby, 60 minutes of that session was active, 30 minutes was, tra was transition. I don't mean feedback, I mean transition, going from one thing to another. 30 minutes out of a 90 minute session is just walking from one thing to another. Three sessions a week, 12 sessions a month. You know, that's a lot of time lost in, trans in transitions. So just looking at how, you know, how much time people spend doing stuff is really interesting and can be an eye opener. So the system itself, yep, does all that great stuff, but I'll talk it say again, observer training and reliability. You need to understand the behaviours, you need to be able to recognise it in coaches to get, be good at coding. So the skill with the system is around the coding and being able to recognise and understand the behaviours. If you do it and you are a coach, it really improves your analytical skills and you're kind of, you can start really listening to what people are saying and picking out the stuff. So it's quite a cool experience. What do we end up with? Well, we end up with... There's a, there's a core template, but you can basically, because you can slide different behaviours, you can say, right, I'm going to look at a technical practice and I'm just going to look at feedback and questioning. So you can create endless combinations of templates regarding whether it's whatever the question is you want to answer. So multiple bespoke coding, you can code live, obviously, and give instant feedback or, and or sync to the video. And I think it's a great coach education tool. So we'll talk about that. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all of this, otherwise we would be here for about three weeks. So, you know, we've, it's a Saturday and we have lives to live, so we won't do that. 
just looking at some of the research, picking out some of the highlights. So this is 65 sessions with academy football coaches between 9 and 21s. And some of the highlights. So training form is just a type of practice that doesn't involve decision making. So repetitive skill drills or um, physical conditioning type work. So over half their practice type had no decision making. Okay, Ten Generally give instruction. Silence increased when they did more game-like stuff but the amount of questions reduced. Okay, Twice as likely to ask a closed or convergent question. A convergent question is a question that gives you an option. Um, it, it directs you towards an answer. It's not a yes-no question. Okay, so you receive the ball there. Are you going to pass backwards or forwards? That's a convergent question because it kind of directs you towards an answer. Okay, a divergent question is, I receive the ball there. What are your passing options? Forwards, backwards, I'm not going to pass. Whatever. So that's a divergent question. Divergent questions are better for learning because you have to think. Any question that makes you think is good for learning. Any question that is just a test of memory, not good for learning. Okay. What's more interesting is once we look at the data, share it with the coaches and talk about it, this is the kind of stuff that they say. Well, golly me, I didn't think I was doing that. <laughs> yeah, I don't look to change my behaviour between types of practice. That's interesting. Coaches in the room, do you think about changing your behaviour or do you just coach the same regardless of what's happening? Questioning, when I've asked players questions, it takes them longer to understand, so I just tell them, okay? I mainly use questions that I've heard. I struggle to devise my own divergent questions, so again, around people shooting from the hip with the questioning rather than thinking about their questioning up front. Same sort of project, hockey, field hockey, volleyball and basketball coaches. Again, the edited highlights, um, tr technical practices, feedback, these are the sorts of behaviours that they were doing. Really interesting behaviour pattern with across these sports, very technical, concurrent, i.e. giving feedback to whilst people are still doing something and to the individual. But what was interesting around this was the behaviour pattern. So if I went into a sports hall or onto a court with a blindfold on and just listened to the coach, I'd say, I'll tell you what, that's the practice that that coach is doing. Conversely, if I had the headphones on and could see the coach, see what practice they're doing, I could say, I bet you their coach is saying that. So there was a real pattern linked to behaviour and practice type, so much so it predicted with these coaches. So again, any coaches in the room, how does that work with you? Do you know? Have you ever thought about it? Interesting. Similar sort of finding around awareness and understanding. Okay, this is around age. Should we change our coaching behaviour with, with, with age? Well, yes, someone who's nine years old and yay high, it's not the same as someone who's 18 years old and yay high. So, you know, they are different species almost, aren't they? So, yes, our coaching behaviours should change. And the data suggested it did. Great. Thumbs up. But when we speak to the coaches, hmm, it's really hard to find them accounting for their behaviour according to the age and stage of development of their athlete. It's more about what they think is good coaching, regardless of the age of the player. So the point being, if we shuffled the coaches around, they'd still be coaching the same way because that's what they thought good coaching looked like. Okay? When they're playing again, it's quicker to tell them, okay, great. There's an expectation from parents to give instruction. You know, a coach tells people what to do, right? Of course they do. So that's what they do. I'm silent because there's nothing to coach. I don't think of using silence when I coach them. There's no process. So again, this assumption around coaching being about telling people and not standing back and observing. Um, I use questioning because on my coaching badges I had to, okay. Um, again, oh, there's a mention of age. I don't use as much questioning. The players at this age might have done, not done this before. So again, this notion of checking for understanding or memory testing in terms of questioning, I think it's a really good opportunity to ask people questions. Okay, if you're in situation, that player's going there and that player's going there, where are you going? Uh, and, uh, I might do that. It's a great answer. If they've not done it before, how the hell are they going to work it out? Okay, interesting. Okay, can we change coaching behaviour? Yes, we can. Edited highlights. Look at the length of the intervention. Okay, this is working twice a week with coaches over seven or eight weeks to actually get a change in behaviour. Takes time, okay? Blah, blah, blah. Time. Context. 
It's really interesting, you work with a coach, you get a behavioural change, a noticeable behavioural change, but they go back in an environment that doesn't support that change, the change gets washed out. So I come back, I amend my coaching behaviour and I start coaching a certain way and the mate, um, my mate or whoever's going, what are you doing that for? We don't do it like that here. And it kind of gets erased back. So context is really important. And we expect our athletes to practice <laughs> stuff. You know, how many times do I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to have a go, practice my questioning tonight. I'm going to give it a go. Work on my questioning with my athletes. I'm going to do some practice. The assumption is we can all do it as coaches, but we expect our athletes to do rep. Yeah, okay. The data plus the video is a really powerful reflective tool. And this is just, whoa, step back. Don't need to worry about it. So this is three years worth of data with a professional, with a set of professional coaches. The interesting thing for me, Start and the end of each season, film, record, tell us what you're doing. Film, record, tell us what you're doing. And without any intervention, we see a shift in their behaviour. This is coaches just looking at themselves, talking about themselves and trying to justify how does that fit with player learning. So instruction down, questioning up, feedback. It's the quality of feedback. Silence up, silence on task. So there's a real shift, you know, whether that's the right profile, whatever that means or not, it doesn't really matter. But what you see is this, the data plus the, uh, the video is a really powerful tool that make people reflect. It's, it becomes like a catalyst for going, oh, I'm, you know, I've got something to hang my hat on here in terms of coaching. So Leicester City case study with the software, the elite player performance plan, what requires them to do this stuff, okay? So Leicester are using the software, they're filming their coaches, collecting data. We've been doing it about three years, four years. Uh, someone, there was a predecessor to Sean, he collected some data and now Sean's doing the work. And this is the sort of thing we're looking at. So we've got a practice type, technical practice, skills practice, small-sided game. And we're just looking at some different coaches. You know, again, some of the prof profiles have changed, some of the profiles haven't. But we've got some actual stuff, actual data to talk to the coaches about, okay? So we can see, see changes over season. Again, this is questioning by technical practice, skills practice. So we can really nail in, look at the different types of practice and the different types of behavior and collect data on it and see how people are changing or not. And again, this is instruction. Some of them big differences, some of them no difference at all. As Chris said, my name is Sean and I'm the coach analyst at Leicester City, so I work between the under nines and the under 21s. And the way I use it is for the coach's development. I get each coach, I sit down, I record three sessions with them, I code them using the system. And then I talk to two players within the group about the behaviours that are categorised in the system. And I usually try and talk to their assistant or a coach who's worked with them. They're normally quite like brief interviews. And then after that, I kind of create a, an interview guide where we, I create a lot of questions I can ask. And we sit down for basically like a two hour interview, um, which sounds a bit long and it probably is. But it's kind of, we found that to be kind of the best way of doing this. Uh, so the first hour, we just sit down, we talk about their beliefs and opinions about coaching. Kind of what Chris was talking about earlier, the first thing to, to kind of talk about is, you know, what do you do as a coach? Um, and then for the second hour, we sort of get out the stats and we get out the video and then we talk about, okay, so we've just talked about what you believe in as a coach and what you think you do. Now we're going to talk about what this is telling us we, you actually do. And we kind of see how those two line up against each other. And uh, so over the course of that hour, kind of highlight certain areas that maybe they're not happy with. And uh, we kind of just decide, right, going forward, these two or three areas, I'm going to improve in X and Y way. So after the end of that interview, uh, I give them like an experimental period, normally it's around a month, where you know, I'm there informally, I won't record any sessions, but we can kind of talk about the, the sort of the processes and how he's trying to change his practice. And at the end of that period, we do another video feedback session where I record and analyze his session, and we sit down for a much briefer stint, only like half an hour, and we talk about kind of specifically the areas that we highlighted previously. So what we talked, what you wanted to work on, has it changed, how has it changed, how are you finding it, do you prefer the way it used to be, how are the players finding it, that kind of thing. Um, at the end of that session, we kind of reassess, sort of, do we want to continue on this road, kind of working on these areas, or maybe we've found something else and we kind of want to work again on 
kind of another area. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, how the process works, kind of then keeps on going through a cycle. And the feedback we've been getting from the coaches has so far have been like really good. Um, we've kind of been using sort of a more qualitative approach this season, I'd say with the interviews and stuff, that's kind of new. And the coaches have just kind of bought into it quite a lot. They, as Chris has said, like they're often very surprised by the, um, the, the statistical feedback in the videos. They're like, you know, they can't believe it's them or whatever. But the interviews has given them a chance to kind of talk about, well, actually, no, the reason why I was doing that or whatever it is. And so they're giving some really good rationale and we're getting really good discussions around coaching. So it's been really good. Um, also, maybe some of the coaches who were a little bit more resistant to the technology previously, um, they've kind of bought into it a lot more because they feel like it's not just, you know, they feel like they can feed back about, talk about it more and kind of get a great understanding of kind of, you know, what we're trying to get at and what is good coaching. If you recall from the really busy slide, the three-year data, we gave those coaches no information about good or bad coaching. We didn't even talk about their coaching at all. It was literally, here's your profile, explain what it is you're doing. How does it link to your players' learning outcomes? What are you trying to achieve in sessions? Are you happy with what you do in terms of what you're trying to achieve? Not, you should do more of this, you should do less of that, this is good, this is nothing. And just let them kind of figure it out. And the people who talk too much quickly realise I talk too much and talk less. You know, the people who th say, well, I thought I was asking questions, but I'm actually just telling this person what to do. Think about their questioning. So it's, it's really interesting. It's almost a an accidental intervention. You know, so there's not me or Sean or anyone saying, you know, good coaching looks like this or you should or shouldn't be doing those things. It's about, OK, you're trying to achieve this with the players. You're doing this here. And this is, but this is what you're actually doing. Are you happy with how that fits together? This is a hockey event. This is, I think it might have been England hockey. Just a one-day event, we got 12 coaches, got them to watch some uh, video, I think it was video of me, <laughs> video, <laughs> video nasty, video of me coaching, um, and got them to comment on it. So 12 coaches, 12 different opinions, yeah, preferences, what they liked, what they didn't like. We gave them the, the definitions from the system and said, okay, watch the video again, but see if you can start identifying some of these things. And again, what that did, it just gave them a common language, it got them to start looking at the coaching as a whole rather than just the little bits that they liked or didn't like. We then got them to deliver a session which we filmed. We had lunch. While they were having lunch, we uploaded the footage onto the iPads, broke them into small groups, said, off you go, start coding your own behavior. And it was, again, groups of three, really powerful. And co efficacy is just situational self-confidence. So people talk about self-efficacy. I'm confident that I can score this penalty or whatever, situational. In coaching efficacy, I'm confident at being a coach. I'm confident at working with these players. And typically in coach education, you do coach education and your confidence goes up. I, I'm, I believe I'm better after doing this. We did a coaching efficacy measure with these coaches and it went down. And the reason it went down was they'd watched themselves coaching and they suddenly thought, Ugh, I don't think I'm doing this as I thought I was doing it. So now I'm not quite as confident about this. So again, the situation is that needs to drop before it goes up. Call it disjuncture. There's a range of terms in the learning literature around we need to shake people up a little bit before they learn. And that was a nice example of that. OK, just to finish off then. Coach behaviours are controllable. Self-awareness is really important. Even if it's just showing video to people about them coaching is really important. We can definitely change coaching behaviour, but it takes time. The focused intervention is seven or eight weeks. We're looking at three seasons for some of these guys to see a real difference. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, there is a specific practice research link. I hope I've shown a little bit of that. Um, you know, and it's all around analysis. It starts with the analysis. What do we do? What do you do as a coach? Can we organise it in some kind of structure and then give you some feedback on it?